and on the basis of love and compassion, then have the aspiration to attain full Buddhahood so you can bring about the happiness of other living beings and eliminate their dukkha or their suffering. And make that bodhicitta the aspiration for full awakening in order to benefit living beings most effectively. Make that your motivation for being here tonight and for us sharing the Dharma together. So last night, we uh, completed up to chapter six. And tonight, we'll start with chapter seven, which uh, is one of the um, perhaps most humorous and uh, most um, profound chapters. So, Manjushri, um, remember he's there talking to Vimalakirti and <clears throat> all the other bodhisattvas and shravakas and other living beings are all around. Uh, but remember that Vimalakirti's house disappeared and that then they brought in all these thrones from another pure land. Yeah. Okay, so remember the scene where all this is happening. So Manjushri asks Vimalakirti, how uh, does a bodhisattva generate the, ge the great love towards sentient beings? Good question, isn't it? Because we can't make ourselves love anybody. Yeah, we can't say, Oh, I love sentient beings. Even that guy is a jerk. You know, because if you have that thought of somebody being a jerk, then that impedes your having love for them. Okay, so Vimalakirti gives some very good advice here. And he says, Manjushri, when a bodhisattva considers all living beings in this way, he thinks, just as I have realized the Dharma, so should I teach it to living beings. Okay. He wants sentient beings to have ha happiness. So he thinks, whatever dharma I've understood, I will teach it to others. Thereby, he generates the love that is truly a refuge for all living beings. The love that is peaceful because it is free of grasping. The love that is not feverish because it is free of afflictions. The love that accords with reality, because it is equanimous in all three times. The love that is without conflict, because of being free of the violence of the afflictions. Okay, so he's talking about a special kind of love here. It's not what we usually call love like in the pop songs and the musics, which is uh, by and large attachment. Yeah. But this is a kind of love that is much deeper and never gives up on sentient beings, yeah. never abandons them, and that is equal towards all living beings, no matter how living beings act towards that bodhisattva. So it's very different than our love, isn't it? Because if somebody's nice to us, then our love is pretty big. If somebody's not nice, our love shrivels. Okay. But for a bodhisattva, they care about all living beings equally, no matter how the, those living beings treat them. Okay. Pretty profound ability. But this is why we can trust bodhisattvas, <coughs> because they don't play favorites. 
<clears throat> then Manjushri asks Vimalakirti, what is the great compassion of a bodhisattva? And Vimalakirti said, it is the giving of all accumulated roots of virtue to all living beings. Yeah, so sharing our merit, sharing our root of virtue with all living beings. <clears throat> when I first uh, came to Singapore in 1987, there was a man who uh, came and asked me to teach him how to meditate. And so I did. And then at the end of the session, I said, now we're going to dedicate the merit and share it, you know, uh, to, with all other living beings. And he looked at me with this expression of alarm, and he said, but I have so little merit, I don't want to give it away. Yeah. And then I had to explain to him that merit is not like money, that if you give it away, you don't have it. Rather, the more you share and dedicate your merit, the more it increases. So I think that made him relax a little bit. But you can see that this is important for uh, bodhisattva's compassion. Then Manjushri asks, what is the great joy of the bodhisattva? And Vimalakirti said, it is to be joyful without regret in giving. Yeah, so to be able to give without having any regret. Without thinking, oh, but I gave it and now I don't have it. Okay. To be able to give where the giving itself is the reward of the giving not expecting thank you, appreciation, good reputation, our name on the side of the whatever it is we donated. Okay. <clears throat> and then Manjushi said, what is the equanimity of the Bodhisattva? And Vimalakirti says, it is what benefits both self and others. So this is an important point, that when we act with virtue, we benefit both ourself and others. Yeah. So don't think that when you cherish others that you're going to suffer, or that to show that you're really compassionate, you have to suffer. It's not like that. Yeah. When we uh, really act with bodhisattva intention, uh, then it benefits everybody. And there's not this distinguishing thing between what helps me and what helps you. It comes to the same point. So you see here that Manjushri just asked Vimalakirti about how a bodhisattva practices the four Brahma Viharas, or the four immeasurables. And then Manjushri asks, uh, to what should one resort when terrified by fear of life? And Vimalakirti says, Manjushri, a bodhisattva who is terrified by fear of life should resort to the magnanimity, magnanimity of the Buddha. Okay? So when we're afraid, when fear comes up, Take refuge in the Buddha. Think of the Buddha's all-pervading goodwill that extends to us, and then try yourself to have that same goodwill, that same magnanimity towards other living beings. And that protects us from fear. <clears throat> okay, so you don't need... <clears throat> some big person there to protect you. Yeah, what really protects us is our own attitude. <coughs> okay, now comes the interesting part.
Okay, so a certain goddess who lived in Vimalakirti's house, having heard this teaching of the Dharma, of the great heroic bodhisattvas, and being decided, delighted, pleased, and overjoyed, manifested herself in a material body and showered the great spiritual heroes, the bodhisattvas, and the, the shravakas, the disciples, with heavenly flowers. So this goddess appears, and she's happy, and she has all these flowers that she showers upon the bodhisattvas, as well as the shravakas, the hearers, the solitary realizers. But when the flowers fell on the bodies of the bodhisattvas, they fell off their bodies onto the floor. But when the flowers fell on the bodies of the shravakas, Shariputra and so on, they stuck to them and did not fall. So the great disciples, the shravakas, shook the flowers. They tried to get the flowers off of them. <coughs> and even tried to use their magical powers to get rid of the flowers, but still the flowers would not shake off. Then the goddess said to Venerable Shariputra, Reverend Shariputra, why do you shake these flowers? Yeah. And Shariputra replied, Goddess, these flowers are not proper for religious persons and monastics, and so we are trying to shake them off because as monastics, we have a precept not to wear uh, flower ornaments or jewelry or anything that beautifies the body. So Shariputra is trying to be this really strict, good monk, yeah, and not have any flowers yeah, and not break even the smallest precept but he can't shake the flowers off. So he's in a bit of trouble here. And the goddess replied to Shariputra, do not say that, Reverend Shariputra. Why? These flowers are proper indeed. Why? Such flowers have neither conceptualization nor discrimination. But the elder Shariputra has both conceptualization and discrimination. Okay. So the flowers themselves, there's nothing wrong with them. They're just material things. The flowers do not have a lot of conceptualization. They are, the flowers are not saying, oh, I'm going to stick to Shariputra's body and be an ornament and make him look good, okay? And the flowers are not thinking, I'm going to stick to Shariputra's body and make him embarrassed because everybody thinks that he's a good monk and should not be wearing flowers, but there he is with flowers. So the flowers, they don't have any problem. They're not full of all these conceptualizations. But the goddess is saying, Shariputra, you're full of a lot of conceptualizations. You're the one that's making a big deal out of the flowers, not the flowers. Okay. So it, she's kind of, you know, pushing Shariputra here. Reverend Shariputra, impropriety for one who has renounced the world for the discipline of the rightly taught dharma consists of conceptualization and discrimination. Yet the elders are full, I think, okay, so that's impropriety. So if you've really renounced the world, to follow the discipline of the Dharma, then it's not proper that you have a lot of conceptualizations, you know, meaning 
all these thoughts of this and that and what are people going to think of me and how am I supposed to look in other people's eyes and, you know, all the useless kinds of thought. I'm not talking about, you know, a correct way of thinking. I'm talking about our garbage way of thinking. So that's improper for someone who's renounced the world to practice the Dharma, says the goddess. And yet she looks at, at Shariputra and says, but you elders are full of such thoughts. And one who is not, uh, someone who is without those thoughts is someone who is proper. So she's pointing out a fault in Shariputra's practice. Reverend Shariputra, see how these flowers do not stick to the bodies of the great spiritual heroes, the bodhisattvas. This is because they have eliminated conceptualization and false discrimination. Okay. For example, yeah, evil spirits have power over feel, fearful people but cannot disturb the fearless. Okay. Why do evil spirits have power over fearful people, but not over the fearless? Because when we are afraid, what is making us afraid is all these conceptual thoughts, all this false kind of chatter. Oh, there's a spirit. It's going to get me. I'm terrified. What's going to happen to me? Woe is me. How can I stop the spirit? Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. You know what the Buddha says to do if you feel there's spirit harm? You cultivate love for the spirit. You don't fear it. You see it as a suffering sentient being and you cultivate love and compassion. Or you see the spirit as empty of having an essence. There's no inherently existent person that is that spirit. Okay. Likewise, those intimidated by fear of the world are in the power of form, sound, smells, tastes, and textures which do not disturb those who are free of the afflictions inherent in the constructed world. Okay? So if you've really realized emptiness and you've conquered all these distorted thoughts, you know, especially concerning things that we see, hear, taste, touch, uh, smell, and think about, yeah. You know, if we've eliminated all sorts of conceptualizations about those things, then we don't have ignorance, anger, and attachment arise in relationship to them, and therefore we aren't captivated by them, and they don't bother us. Okay. Thus, these flowers stick to the bodies of those who have not eliminated their latencies for the afflictions, but do not stick to the bodies of those who have eliminated those latencies. So if you're free of afflictions, the flowers, nothing sticks to you. People insult you, you lose your job, nothing bothers you. Yeah. When we haven't eliminated the afflictions, then our mind makes a big deal about everything that concerns me, who happens to be the center of the universe. And that's where fear comes in. Okay? The mind is creating the fear, not the object. Okay? So the flowers do not stick to the bodies of these bodhisattvas who have abandoned all the latencies of the afflictions. Then Jariputra changes the topic. And he says, Goddess, how long have you been in this house? And the goddess replied, 
I have been here as long as the elder, Sariputra, has been in liberation. And Sariputra said, then have you been in this house for quite some time? And the goddess said, has the elder been in liberation for quite some time? And at that, Shariputra fell silent. He didn't know what to say. So then the goddess said, Elder Shariputra, you are the foremost of the wise disciples of the Buddha. Why don't you speak? Now when it is your turn, you do not answer the question. And Shariputra, he's really trying to get out of it because he doesn't look so good. He says, since liberation is inexpressible, goddess, I do not know what to say. Okay. So very, you know, this thing about saying things are inexpressible, in one way, the very deep, profound realizations are inexpressible. The experience cannot be put in words. But sometimes when we have no experience or when we don't know the answer to a question, we say, it's inexpressible. So that's the excuse we use for not being able to answer anything. Yeah. If you say to me, what does it feel like to directly realize emptiness? I have no experience. So I say to you, it's inexpressible. Yeah. Then you think, oh, she's really profound. Actually, it's a big excuse for me. Okay. But, you know, that doesn't mean you can never talk about these profound topics. Because for us to learn what emptiness means, we have to listen to teachings. For us to learn what bodhicitta is, we have to listen to teachings. So, you know, there is a way to talk about these things. And we must use words, at least initially, to learn about them, even though at the end we want to go beyond words. So the goddess says to, to Shariputra, all the syllables pronounced by the elder have the nature of liberation. Why? Liberation is neither internal nor external, nor can it be apprehended apart from them. Likewise, syllables are neither internal nor external, nor can they be apprehended anywhere else. Therefore, Reverend Shariputra, do not point to liberation by abandoning speech. Why? The holy liberation is the equality of all things. Yeah. So she's talking about emptiness here. Yeah. That when you dwell in emptiness, you can't locate inherently existent things. Yeah. But... We can still use words to describe them, to teach, and to learn. Then Shariputra says, Goddess, isn't liberation the freedom from attachment, hatred, and confusion? So that's the usual definition of, libera of liberation. Yeah, the extinction of attachment, anger, and confusion. And the Goddess says, Liberation is freedom from attachment, anger, and confusion. That is the teaching of the excessively proud. So people who are really proud, that's what they say liberation is. But those free of pride are taught that the very nature of attachment, anger, and confusion is itself liberation. That seems really contradictory. But if liberation is referring to the ultimate nature, to realizing emptiness, 
then everything lacks inherent nature, including the afflictions. So the afflictions themselves are free of inherent nature. And so we don't really need to be so afraid of them when we realize their emptiness. When we don't realize their emptiness, then we tend, you know, like Shariputra, he wants to be a really, you know, first-class monk. Then he gets very afraid of the afflictions. Okay. So Shariputra says, excellent, excellent goddess. Pray, what have you attained? What have you realized that you have such eloquence? And the goddess says, I have attained nothing, Reverend Shariputra. I have no realization. What she means is, I don't have any inherently existent attainments. So even the attainments, the realizations that we seek along the path, lack inherent nature. I have no realizations, therefore I have such eloquence. Whoever thinks I have attained, I have realized, is overly proud in the discipline of the well-taught dharma. So somebody who goes around saying, I am enlightened, I have realized this, I have realized that. Yeah. They could be grasping on to an inherently existent person and inherently existent realizations, which shows that they haven't realized anything at all. Okay. Then Shariputra asks uh, the goddess, do you belong to the hearer vehicle, to the solitary realizer vehicle, or to the great vehicle, the bodhisattva vehicle? And the goddess says, I belong to the shravaka, the hearer vehicle, when I teach it to those who need it. I belong to the solitary realizer vehicle when I teach the 12 links of dependent origination to those who need to hear that teaching. And I never abandon the great compassion. And since I never abandon the great compassion, I belong to the great vehicle as all need, uh, as all need that teaching to attain ultimate liberation. So the goddess is not willing to be pinned down. And what she's saying is that, you know, as somebody who has great compassion and high realizations, she teaches living beings what they need to hear at any particular time. So not everybody needs to hear the same teaching. So the Buddhas often teach very different things to very different disciples because those disciples have different interests, different dispositions. Okay? One, uh, Achen Shah, he gave a good example of how, you know, a skillful teacher says different things to different uh, disciples. So here's the example. There's a narrow road with a cliff on this side and a cliff on this side. Okay. If somebody's walking down this side of the road and is in danger of falling off this cliff, somebody with compassion says, lean to the left, lean to the left. If somebody's walking along the left side of the road as in and is in danger of falling over that cliff, the wise, compassionate guide says, go right, go right. So even though the instructions are the opposite, one is go left, one is go right, according to what each individual needs, that particular advice is going to help them 
and keep them in the middle of the road so they aren't in danger anymore. Okay, so that's why we find in the Buddha's teachings that he does say different things to different people because he's talking according to what individuals need at that particular time. So then they continue talking some more. And then, then Shariputra gets a little cheeky. And he says, Goddess, what prevents you from transforming yourself out of your female state? Because according to Shariputra and the vehicle he follows, yeah, women are kind of low class. Yeah. They're not too smart. They can't attain awakening. Yeah, they're there to serve the monks. But he met this very intelligent goddess. And so he says, how come you don't transform yourself into a man? Because that way you can attain liberation. That way you can be part of our club and sit at the front of the hall instead of the back of the hall. So the goddess says to Shariputra, although I have sought my female state for these 12 years that, he's, that she's lived at Vimalakirti's house, I have not yet found it. Reverend Shariputra, Okay, so she, she's saying, you know, I've been looking for who in the world is a woman, and I haven't found a woman in myself. Reverend Shariputra, if a magician were to incarnate a woman by magic, would you ask her what prevents you from transforming yourself out of your female state? And Shariputra says, no, such a woman would not really exist. So what would there be to transform? Because it's a magically created woman. So there's nothing to transform. So the goddess says, just so, Reverend Shariputra, all things do not really exist. They do not have an inherent fixed nature. Now, would you think what prevents one whose nature is that of a magical incarnation from transforming herself out of her female state? So she's saying, me, you know, I can't find what's female about me because the person is empty and male and female are empty. And so, like everything else, I exist like an illusion. Okay? Not as an illusion, but like an illusion, in that conventional things appear inherently existent, but they don't actually exist that way. So she says to Shariputra, since I, I'm empty of inherent existence, you know, then why are you asking me? Uh, what keeps me from transforming myself out of my female state? Especially when I don't even, I can't even find anything about me that's a woman. Okay, because when you look at it, okay, we, we have very strong identities. I am a man, I am a woman. I am a man, therefore you should treat me like this, this, this. I should be able to do that, that, that. You know, or I am a woman, therefore I act this, 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 you know, and you should treat me like this and this and this. You know, we have very strict uh, role discriminations in society for men and women. Okay. And this was, for example, one of Hillary Clinton's, uh, what affected her running for president is many people thought, how can a woman be president? 
Yeah. She was actually and is more actually qualified than Trump, more intelligent than him, more, you know. She hasn't done half the negative things he's done. But people think, oh, but she's a woman. How can she run the country? Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm the abbess of Shravasti Abbey. Whenever people uh, don't know from my name, Tukton Chudron, whether it's a male's name or a female name, they write, Dear Sir. I get so many letters that say, Dear Sir. Yeah. Especially from Buddhist organizations. Because they assume that if you're the leader of a monastery, you must be a man. And it's very interesting. I think the women here will understand. But, you know, if a man speaks forcefully, they say, oh, he's a leader. If a woman speaks forcefully, they say, she's a bitch. <laughs> yeah, it's true, isn't it? If you, you know, if women work in the corporate world, yeah, the men always interrupt them in the meetings. There's so many studies done about this kind of thing. Yeah. And in the US now, there's this whole thing about a sexual harassment. Have you read about it in the newspapers? Yeah, so it's a big thing because many men in the office place, they, they just say, well, you know, women's attractive. I can touch her. I can do whatever I want. Yeah, she's lower power than me. She can't say anything. If she says anything, I just deny it. And I'm a man and people will side with me. And that's how it's been until now. And now it's just amazing what's happening. The women are really speaking up. And all these men are like, yeah. Three men from the US Congress resigned in one week because women spoke about them uh, sexually harassing them. Now all we need is for the president to resign. <laughs> But we better go back to the Malakirti here. OK. So that's how the Malakirti, how the goddess answered for Malakirti. So now, what does the goddess do? Thereupon, the goddess employs her magical power to cause the elder Shariputra to appear in her form and to cause herself to appear in his form. Then the goddess transformed into Shariputra. So she became a man and she made him become a woman. And then she, she as Shariputra, says to Shariputra, who's now a woman, Reverend Shariputra, what prevents you from transforming yourself out of your female state? Yeah, I think this is hilarious. And Shariputra, who's transformed into the goddess, replied, I no longer appear in the form of a male. My body is changed into the body of a woman. I do not know what to transform. Because he had such a strong identity as a man. The goddess continued, if the elder could ch again change out of the female state, then all women would also change out of their female states. All women appear in the form of women, 
in just the same way as the elder appears in the form of a woman, <clears throat> as like an illusion due to causes and conditions. While they are not women in reality, they appear in the form of women. With this in mind, the Buddha said, in all things, there is neither male nor female. When you sit quietly on your meditation cushion and your mind is very peaceful, can you find what about you is either male or female? Do you have a female mind or a male mind? No, you just have a mind. Do you have a female Buddha nature or a male Buddha nature? No, you just have Buddha nature. Do you have female afflictions or male afflictions? No, you just have afflictions. Some people say women are more emotional than men. That isn't my experience. Yeah, I think that is an old, old stereotype. Because my experience in being the abbess of an abbey, we have men coming there. They are just as emotional as women. In fact, about uh, a month ago or two months ago, we had a group of men there. And they couldn't get along with each other. So all the nuns, who are harmonious, had to sit down with the men and go through some discussions to help them work out their differences. Yeah. So I don't believe in these old stereotypes. Okay. Then the goddess released her magical power and each one of them returned to their ordinary form. Okay. So she again became a woman he again became a man, but neither one of them are male or female. Yeah. Because basically, we discriminate male and female based on the arrangement of some molecules in our body. That's it. And she says, Reverend Shariputra, what have you done with your female form? And Shariputra said, I neither made it nor did I change it. And so she said, just so, all things are neither made nor changed. They do not inherently arise. They do not inherently change and that they are not made and not changed. That is the teaching of the Buddha. So she's talking about things not being inherently existent. Then Shariputra says, Goddess, where will you be born when you transmigrate after death? And the goddess says, I will be born where all the magical incarnations of the Tathagata are born. Shariputra says, but the emanated incarnations of the Tathagata do not transmigrate, nor are they born. If you become a Tathagata, a Buddha, you are free of the 12 links of dependent arising. You don't take rebirth in samsara. So, you know, goddess, what are you saying? <laughs> yeah. And the goddess says all things and living beings are just the same. They do not transmigrate, nor are they born. Okay, so again, they aren't inherently existent. They don't inherently change. All these hap things happen 
due to causes and conditions, their dependent arisings. So then Shariputra, he asks her, Goddess, how soon will you attain the perfect enlightenment of Buddhahood? And she says, at such a time as you, elder, become endowed once more with the qualities of an ordinary individual, then I will attain the perfect enlightenment of Buddhahood. So Shariputra, you're an arhat. When you fall back and you become an ordinary person, that's the time when I'll attain Buddhahood. So Shariputra scratches his head and he says, Goddess, it is impossible that I should become endowed once more with the qualities of an ordinary individual. Because he's an arhat, he can't fall back. And she says, just so, Reverend Shariputra, it is impossible that I should attain the perfect enlightenment of Buddhahood. Why? Because perfect enlightenment stands upon the impossible. Because it is impossible, no one attains the perfect enlightenment of Buddhahood. In other words, enlightenment is not something with its own essence out there for us to grab at. And even when we become enlightened, there's no real person. I am a Buddha. Okay. There's just a dependently arising person who attains a dependently arising Buddhahood. So Shariputra says, but the Tathagata has declared, the Tathagatas who are as numerous as the sands of the Ganges have attained perfect Buddhahood, are attaining perfect Buddhahood, and will go on to attain perfect Buddhahood. So what in the world are you saying, goddess, that it's impossible for you to attain Buddhahood? And it's impossible for anybody to attain Buddhahood. So he hasn't understood what she's actually saying. And she says, Reverend Shariputra, the expression, the Buddhas of the past, present, and future, is a conventional expression made up of a certain number of syllables the Buddhas are neither past, nor present, nor future. Their enlightenment transcends the three times. But tell me, Elder, have you attained our hardship? And Shariputra said, says, it is attained because there is no attainment. So he's starting to get it. And so she says, just so, there is no perfect enlightenment because there is no attainment of perfect enlightenment. So you know in the, in the Heart Sutra? Yeah, when it says there's no attainment, no non-attainment, this is what it's referring to. There's no inherently existent attainment of enlightenment, and there's no inherently existent non-attainment of being an ordinary being. All these things exist dependent on other factors. They are empty. Okay, so that's chapter seven. Did you like chapter seven? I think chapter seven's great. Yeah, it's, it has much more in it than I explained. Okay, now we're gonna go a little bit more quickly. Okay, so chapter eight. So here, uh, Manjushri asks Vimalakirti, how does a bodhisattva master the way of the Buddha? And Vimalakirti says he follows a path that is not the way. Then he can master the Buddha's way. Okay. So there's no inherently existent path to follow either. But by following a path, that is not inherently existent, but is dependent, that way the bodhisattva can master the, the way of the Buddha. Okay. So he, he appears 
the bodhisattva appears deceitful, but is skilled in means of liberation and faithful to the sutras. He appears arrogant, but serves as a bridge for living beings. He may appear to possess wealth, but regards it as transient and co covets none of it. Though appearing to employ unortho unorthodox methods of liberation, he follows the correct dharma. So a very high-level bodhisattva, yeah, does whatever is necessary to benefit whatever sentient beings are in front of them. And in that way, they don't always look like holy beings. Okay. For example, many people say to me, yeah, there's got to be Buddhas in our world because Buddhas have attained awakening. They did so for the benefit of sentient beings. So there's got to be Buddhas in our world. How come they don't announce themselves and say, I'm a Buddha? Because, you know, if they did, then we would have so much faith. We would follow their teachings. They should really let us know that they're Buddhas. Actually, it would be so unskillful for a Buddha to say, in today's day and age, I'm enlightened. Why? Yeah. All the news outlets would send their reporters to interview him. Are you a Buddha? You said you're a Buddha. How can you prove it? Can you do magical things? Yeah. Do you have a certificate saying you're a Buddha? Yeah. So all the, you know, the journalists would come. They would want to put him in Peaceful People magazine, in, you know, Time magazine, newspaper, the Straits Times, you know, front page Straits Times, Buddha arrives in Singapore, exclusive interview. Okay, oh, the journalists would love this. They'd make a ton of money, okay? That wouldn't be very skillful, would it, on the part of a Buddha? Because if somebody says, you know, they're a Buddha, and then they do magical powers, you know, they display their magical powers, then we would all go, oh, wow, oh, wow, they're a Buddha. And we would bow down and we would worship them, but we would not practice the path they teach. Because we would be, you know, because you know how we are, ordinary sentient beings. We like, you know, give me a movie star to go, you know, go, 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 go. give me a sports hero to idolize, you know, give me some other person to just sit at and say, oh, 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 they're perfect, they're perfect, I adore you, I'm devoted to you, you're the one and only. That's how we are. We're really very foolish, aren't we? Yeah? If the, so if the Buddha appeared and showed his magical powers, we would just worship him. We wouldn't listen to a single teaching. We wouldn't engage in any practice. So what does the Buddha do? He has to appear as an ordinary being, like us. You know? Some average person, you know, monk, nun, lay person, somebody who teaches the Dharma. And then we think, well, OK. They kind of look, they, they know some dharma. I guess I'll listen to their teaching and try and practice it. That's how we are, aren't we? But if somebody has a good reputation, you know, if somebody comes to Singapore and they have a whole string of titles, they are Lama, Tulku, Reverend, His Holiness, His Eminence, Rinpoche. I am your disciple. Yeah. Even the guy's an idiot. Yeah. We have no discriminating wisdom. 
we just go for the titles. Somebody sits on a high throne, lots of brocade, long horns. Oh, they must be a holy being. Yeah. People go up to His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, and say, is it true that you're Kuan Yin? I heard you're Kuan Yin embodied. Is it true? Yeah? And they so much want His Holiness to say, well, I'm glad you asked. Yes, I am. But His Holiness doesn't say that. He says, I'm a simple monk. That's all. I'm a simple monk. And he doesn't even call himself a teacher. He says, even though I sit on the throne, I see myself as an older brother sharing what I know with my friends. Yeah? His Holiness, so humble. Yeah. People who don't know much, so arrogant. So we are very, you know, we're, we don't always think so straightly. Yeah. Okay, so then we go on to chapter 9. Okay, so here in chapter 9, each bodhisattva, uh, with Manjushri at the end, explains uh, non-duality. And when each bodhisattva, so the bodhisattvas are getting braver. Remember at the beginning, they didn't even want to go near Vimalakirti. Now they're explaining their understanding of non-duality and Vimalakirti's presence. And Vimalakirti uh, silently sits there, you know, and takes in what they're saying. And so Vimalakirti is showing yeah, his understanding of non-duality by remaining uh, silent. Yeah. Okay. And so uh, Manjushri uh, speaks at the end and he says, to my way of thinking, all phenomena are without words, without explanations, without intention, without cognition, beyond questions and answers. In this way, one may enter the gate of non-duality. Then Manjushri asked Vimalakirti, what is non-duality? How does one enter non-duality? And Vimalakirti remains silent. So Vimalakirti's silence is indicative of his wisdom because he's showing that the actual realization cannot be explained in words. Okay. And Manjushri uh, says, excellent, excellent, not a word, not a syllable. This truly is to enter the gate of non-duality. Okay, so when we have the actual realization of emptiness, there's, we're not thinking in terms of words. There's no uh, process of words and terms and things like that. There's just the direct perception of emptiness. Okay, then chapter 10. This is kind of a fun chapter, too. So uh, in, in this chapter, in chapter 10 here, let me get it. Okay, so they've been talking for a while, right? So then, Shariputra thinks to himself, if these great bodhisattvas, who are also monastics, do not adjourn before noontime, when are they going to eat? Yeah. 
So you remember Shari Boutre yesterday? He was concerned where everybody's gonna sit. And, you know, Vamala Kirti said, you know, did you come here for the Dharma or did you come here for a chair? Now Shari Putra is saying, it's almost noon. And as monastics, we have to finish our meal before noon. And if we don't stop the Dharma teaching soon, we won't get to have lunch. And so Vamala Kirti has the ability to read Shariputra's mind. And uh, so he knows what Shariputra's what thinking. And he says, Reverend Shariputra, the Tathagata has taught the eight liberations. These are eight states of very deep samadhi. You should concentrate on those liberations. Concentrate listening to the Dharma with a mind free of preoccupations with material things like lunch. You know? Like, Shari Bhutra, we're having this incredible discussion about non duality, and you're thinking about pizza, you know? <laughs> and then Vamala Kirti says, wait a minute, Shari Bhutra and you will eat such food as you have never tasted before. So then, a Vamala Kirti emanated another bodhisattva, yeah, from himself. And he, um, uh, okay, well first, before that, um, Vimala Kirti asked all of the bodhisattvas, good sirs, is there any among you who would like to go? So Vimala Kirti showed them this one fantastic Buddha field, yeah, another pure land, where all the bodhisattvas were having lunch. And then he asks all the bodhisattvas there, uh, would any of you like to go and pick up the food and bring it back to us? Okay, so there's going to be takeout lunch. We're getting it from this other pure land. And, you know, who wants to jump in? You know, who wants to go to this other pure land and bring back lunch? And none of the bodhisattvas volunteer to go. Okay. So, um, yeah, so then Vimalakirti. Uh, emanates another bodhisattva from his body, and he sends that bodhisattva off to this other pure land to get the takeout. <laughs> and uh, the other bodhisattva goes to that pure land, bows before the Buddha, bows to the bodhisattvas there, and says, uh, would you uh, please give me the remains of your meal uh, in order to accomplish the Buddha work in the universe called Saha. Our universe is called Saha, mean, meaning the, um, uh, the place of much uh, suffering. Okay. So he's asking this other Buddha, please, can we have the remainder of your food? Then those living beings who aspire to inferior ways may gain the intelligence to aspire to the great dharma of the Buddha, and the name of the Buddha will be celebrated far and wide. So please, if you give us your leftovers, you know, package it in. Uh, we we're, we're, we're don't want any, um, what do you call it, uh, styrofoam package. It's not good for the environment. Yeah, so please package, you know, Give it to us in dishes that we can wash, but unbreakable dishes, please. And we will take it back to the Saha world because these living beings in the Saha world, they aspire to inferior things. They can't think straight. Yeah. And look at our world. People can't think straight in it, can they? We have all sorts of wrong views. We think that fighting wars is the way to live in peace. So stupid. You know, the Buddha said hatred's never conquered by hatred, only by love. So what do we do? We fight wars. 
and the objective is to live in peace. Huh? I mean, we live in a world, really, where people's thoughts are very degenerate. Very degenerate. Okay? But anyway, uh, you know, these other bodhisattvas in this other pure land, when they hear that there's a Tathagata Shakyamuni in this Saha world who is helping all these, like, really degenerate sentient beings, they have so much admiration for him. Yeah. So uh, the Bodhisattva that Vimalakirti sent carries back the takeout food. And the other bodhisattvas from this pure land, they follow along because they're really intrigued. You know, who is this Buddha Shakyamuni who can hang out and stick with these really dumb, inferior sentient beings? Yeah. And the Tathagata in their pure land gave them permission to go, so they all come along. I guess they piled into the bodhisattva vehicle and drove here. <laughs> okay. And so then uh, they arrive back and Vimalakirti speaks to Shariputra and the other uh, hearers and says, eat the food of the Tathagata. It is ambrosia perfumed by the great compassion. But do not fix your mind in narrow-minded attitudes lest you be unable to receive its gift. But some of the disciples <laughs> already had narrow-minded attitudes and were thinking, but how can such a huge multitude of people at Vimalakirti's house eat such a small amount of food? Yeah, because they brought back the leftovers from the other pure land, you know. It doesn't look like much food. How's it all going to go around? Okay, then the incarnate bodhisattva that was, is Vimalakirti said to these disciples, do not compare venerable ones, your own wisdom and merit, with the wisdom and merits of the Tathagata. Why? For example, the four great oceans might dry up but this food would never be exhausted. Yeah. If all living beings were to eat for an eon an amount of this food equal to Mount Sumeru in size, it would not be depleted. Why? Yeah. Because this food is issued forth from inexhaustible ethical conduct concentration, and wisdom. Yeah. So this food that they got from the other pure land is produced by the three higher trainings of ethical conduct, concentration, and wisdom. And for that reason, it can never be exhausted. Okay? So... Uh, so then people say to these, you know, these visiting bodhisattvas, well, how does uh, your Tathagata teach the Dharma? And they say, uh, our Tathagata does not teach the Dharma by means of sound and language. He disciplines the bodhisattvas only by means of perfume. At the foot of each perfume tree sits a bodhisattva and the trees emit perfumes like this one. From the moment they smell that perfume, the bodhisattvas attain the concentration called source of all bodhisattva virtues. From the moment they attain that concentration, all the bodhisattva virtues are produced in them. Woo! Those bodhisattvas have a whole lot of merit. Yeah? So much merit that just by sitting under a perfumed tree, they can gain realizations. But then those bodies, bodhisattvas say to Vimalakirti, 
how does the Buddhist Shakyamuni teach the, the Dharma? And Vimalakirti says, these living beings here are really hard to discipline. Yeah, therefore, he teaches them with discourses appropriate for the disciplining of the wild and uncivilized. Yeah, we think we're very tame and civilized. Okay. How does he discipline the wild and uncivilized? He teaches, this is hell. This is the animal realm. This is the world of the Lord and death, Lord of death. These are the adversities. These are the rebirths. These are the physical non-virtues. These are the, the results of physical non-virtues. These are the verbal misdeeds. These are the, the results of them. These are the mental non-virtues. These are the results of them. So Shakyamuni Buddha had to teach us all about karma, all about cause and effect. Yeah, Go into all sorts of detail about the ten negativities because we're rather thick. Yeah. I, there's another story that I heard that uh, I guess all the, the, the Buddhas were having a conference and they were figuring out which Buddhas were going to go to which worlds to teach the Dharma. And, and so somebody said, well, who's going to go to the Saha world with all these dum-dums? And none of the Buddhas volunteered except Shakyamuni Buddha. He said, I'll go. And all the other Buddhas looked at him like, wow, good luck to you. <laughs> but you know, that's how much compassion Shakyamuni Buddha had, that he is willing to come and teach us and not give up on us. OK, so that's chapter 10. Chapter 11. Okay, uh, so here the Buddha is still over in the garden, remember? Like in chapter 1, he's still in a garden. So, uh, so now Vimalakirti transports uh, everybody that's with him to the garden where the Buddha is. And then the Buddha gives a teaching. Okay. And then in chapter 12... Um, you know, uh, the Buddha opens with a question, because now the Buddha has explained the Dharma in Vimalakirti's presence, and Vimalakirti has explained the Dharma in the Buddha's presence. And uh, Shariputra asks where Vimalakirti was born before. And Vimalakirti says, you know, Yeah, so Shari, oh, actually, Shariputra said to Vimalakirti, where were you born before you came here? And Vimalakirti says, is that the Dharma that you have learned that there are such things as birth and death? Inherently existent birth and death. Shariputra says, no, there is no such thing as birth and death. So Vimalakirti says, why then did you ask me where I was born before I was born? born here. Okay. And then the Buddha, okay, so they're talking about emptiness. There's no birth, there's no person who's born. Then the Buddha says something, and he says, there's a country called Wonderful Joy, Abhira, I think it's pronounced Abhirarati. This is the uh, Akshobhya Buddha's pure land. And the Buddha said, Vimalakirti died in that country and then was born here. So Vimalakirti answered Shariputra's question in terms of emptiness. The Buddha is saying, is answering the question in terms of dependent arising and saying Shari, uh, Vimalakirti did live somewhere. So 
this other pure land is empty of inherent existence, but it exists conventionally. And Vamalakirti was born there. And then he came here. Okay. So now showing, you know, conventional and ultimate truths, their complementary nature. Then chapters 13 and 14 uh, deal with the preservation of uh, the, the Vimalakirti uh, Sutra. And Shariputra uh, promises vast merit for anybody who preserves it. So all the gods and goddesses uh, promise to protect it. And uh, then the Buddha tells a story about how the highest giving is the giving of the, the, of the Dharma, the generosity of the Dharma. And uh, <coughs> the Buddha then charges Maitreya with propagating sutras, such as this one, in the future. And he charges Ananda with memorizing the sutra. And Ananda says that he has already done that. And then everybody in the assembly is filled with great joy at hearing the teachings of the Buddha. And that's the conclusion of the Vimalakirti Sutra. Okay. In the Tibetan tradition, whenever you finish something, you always go back to the beginning and read the very beginning again. As they say, it's auspicious because you start something again, you don't finish it, that means we have to meet again. Okay, so I'll read just a little bit, since we've finished the sutra, a little bit of the beginning. Okay. Reverence to all Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, Arya, Shravakas, Prajeka Buddhas in the past, the present, and the future. Thus have I heard at one time. The Lord Buddha was in residence in the garden of Am Amrapali, in the city of Vasali, attended by a great gathering of bhikshus. There were 8,000. Uh, all of them were arhats. They were free from impurities and afflictions. They all had attained self-mastery. Their minds were entirely liberated by perfect knowledge. They were calm and dignified, like royal elephants. They had accomplished their work done what they had to do, cast off their burdens, attained their goals, and totally destroyed the bonds of existence. They all had attained utmost perfection of every form of mind control. Of bodhisattvas, there were 32,000 great spiritual heroes who were universally acclaimed. They were dedicated through the penetrating activity of their great super-knowledges and were sustained by the grace of the Buddha. Guardians of the city of Dharma, they upheld the true doctrine and their great teachings resounded like the lion's roar throughout the ten directions. Without having to be asked, <clears throat> they were the natural spiritual benefactors of all living beings. They remained unbroken uh, the, they maintained the unbroken succession, succession, succession the continuance, the continuance of the three jewels, conquering uh, Maras and foes and overwhelming all critics. Okay, so that's how the sutra starts out. So maybe we can meet again sometime, someplace and study the sutra again together. Okay, so there's two questions here. Yesterday you spoke, there is no inherently existent I. In daily life, we wish people to treat us cordially with respect, not to be abused. How do we practice no I to be abused or respected, but also don't be a doormat? because I feel bad if people keep stepping over me. If we feel bad that people keep stepping on us, we have not realized emptiness. 
we're still clinging to a real I that needs to be treated with respect and so on. I uh, remember reading a book. It's, it's a beautiful book. It's called Tattoos on the Heart. And it's about a Catholic priest who lives in an impoverished area in Los Angeles where there are a lot of gangs. And he lives there and he gets to know the people. He helps the families. He knows all the gang members from this gang, from that gang. Yeah, he was really fantastic. He started a bakery and employed all the, the gang members so that they could, you know, learn some skill. And he would, you know, drive people here and drive them there and help them with things. And somebody once asked him and said to him, but aren't these gang members taking advantage of you? Asking you to drive them here, drive them there, do this for them, do that for them. And this priest said, I gave away my advantage. Yeah. He had big compassion. Yeah. So if you're concerned, oh, these people are taking advantage of me. I need to be respected. I need to see this. There's clinging to that. Yeah. When this uh, priest said, but I gave away my advantage, he's saying, I don't care how people treat me. I have enough self-confidence in myself that even if people treat me poorly, I'm okay with myself. I don't lose my self-confidence. Now, having said that, if you're, let's say, a teacher in a school, does that mean you let your students call your names and be very rude and so on? Even if you have understood <clears throat> emptiness and you don't feel any offense yourself, you don't take any of it personally, still, you will correct the students and teach the students how to respect their teachers, how to respect other living beings. Because otherwise, you're not helping them. You're letting them just behave in ways that is going to make it very difficult for them when they grow up. Okay. And there was a second question. Yeah. <clears throat> One of Amala Kirti said that illness comes from ignorance. How does ignorance come about? I don't understand why realizing emptiness will cure the ignorance, but I don't know what this ignorance is made up of. Okay, ignorance. We have had ignorance as a mental factor in our mind since beginningless time. So there was no beginning to our mental continuity. There was no beginning to the ignorance. There is an end to the ignorance because ignorance is a, an erroneous mind. It misapprehends things. So whereas things exist dependent, Ignorance thinks they all have an independent essence. So when we realize that there's no independent essence, that things are empty of inherent existence, then the ignorance can no longer stand up because the wind wisdom is perceiving the exact opposite of what wisdom is perceiving. So the the uh, ignorance can be eliminated. Yeah? If we eliminate ignorance, then 
clinging attachment, hatred, jealousy, arrogance, all these kinds of things also can be eliminated because they all come about based on ignorantly grasping at inherent existence. So this is a bit difficult to understand because until we get an idea of how our own ignorance works and how we are ex uh, grasping inherent existence and how inherent existence doesn't really exist, until we get some feeling for all of that, this is difficult to understand. Okay, so it takes, you have to listen to teachings, think about what you hear, meditate on it, yeah, because we don't even see our own ignorance. We are so used to grasping inherent existence that we don't even see it as ignorance. And we think that that's the way things really exist. So I like to give the analogy, like let's say you came out of the womb with sunglasses on and everything you saw was dark. And somebody said to you, you know, you're seeing everything dark and things don't really exist that way. They're actually lighter in color. You have no idea what in the world they're talking about because you've already always seen things as dark and you think that's exactly the way they exist. So that's the same way. We've always seen things ignorantly, thinking they inherently exist. And so it's hard for us to even understand what this means. But if we study and think about it and meditate, eventually we will understand.